today we're bringing you one of the most important interviews we've done to date. We're talking with Daryl Davis, who he's many things. He's an author, he's a speaker, he's a very storied blues musician who has played with Chuck Berry and Jerry Lee Lewis and B.B. King, uh, to name just a few. But Daryl has dedicated the last 30 plus years of his life to bridge building across racial divides. And we find ourselves right now in a time where our country is at a crossroads. And it's during this intersection that we need to really figure out the core source of the problem that we're dealing with and not just pay lip service or put a topical solution that's only going to last a short time. Um, Daryl is living proof that long-term change can happen from within, but it takes reaching across and building these bridges. He does that impeccably well, and this interview is beyond meaningful. So check this out, and please let us know what you think about this. This is important stuff. We are super lucky today to be sitting here with Daryl Davis. Um, Daryl is an incredible world-renowned musician. Uh, definitely want to be mentioning that and talking about music today, too. Um, <laughs> actor, author, and a race relations expert who has a very unique story, um, which we are going to dive in on. So, Daryl, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure. Of course. Um, I... I'm very thankful. Daryl and I had an interview scheduled um, for uh, later in June and obviously for the recent events that have been happening um, after the death of George Floyd. Uh, I had asked if he would maybe be able to push this interview up and thank, thank God he kindly did. So I'm, I'm lucky to be having this conversation, I think, d during the height of what's happening right now. Um, and Daryl, like you and I said earlier, we're going to get into what makes you unique, I think, in the narrative here. But first of all, we can't have this conversation without, without talking about police misconduct and what happened to George Floyd, which wasn't a George Floyd issue. Uh, this is a systemic issue. This is something that has been going on your entire life. Um, you know, so how do you still make the case and, and sorry to start off with this question, but how do you right. still make the case um, that we have to work together on this? How do you not just write me off? Because, you know, the behavior, the misconduct, as you uh, characterized it, is learned behavior. And if something can be learned, it can also be unlearned. And it's up to all of us, all of us, to, to educate one another. You know, people say, you know, it's not our job to educate them. You know, or you know, you know, they, you know, they should know better. Why, why do you, as a as a black person, have to teach white people how to behave? Well, you know what? If they're not behaving and they're killing us, we all need to step in. All of us. You know, we need we need to stop saying, "I'm not my brother's keeper. I am my brother's keeper." You know, we we are all in this together, and uh, that's that's why I do that. So, yes, it makes me angry. It makes me frustrated, but I know that that energy has to be channeled into, into something more positive in order for something positive to come out because anger and frustration and violence will only beget more of the same. Yeah, well, well said. Um, and I think one of the things you do so well, I think the inability to maintain prejudice uh, is, I think that's your secret sauce. From everything I've seen, and, and obviously I've, I've, you know, I'm very aware of the work you do. Um, I feel like your ability to go into a group of adults, right? And who are very hard to, to change. Um, it, to be able to go in there and say that what you have accepted as truth for so long is actually a misconception. Um, and you start watching them not be able to hold that prejudice. What is that like? And how does your work doing that um, transfer to people now who are trying to do similar work out there in the world? Well, first and foremost, you know, in order to do that kind of thing, you have to really study the position of, of the opposing you know, party, whether it's uh, pro-choice or abortion, or, you know, whichever you, you know, you're on the opposite side of, or politics, or for this, in my case, race. Uh, I, I have been studying uh, white supremacists and all kinds of supremacists, black supremacists too, you know, for over 30 years. And... I know the mentality. I know pretty much what to expect. 
-hmm. when dealing with some of these people. So you go in there understanding or, or have a, a, a clear perspective on what you're dealing with. So you're not, you're not blindsided, you know, and then you react out of emotion and anger when you hear something, you know, that you don't want to hear. Well, if you don't want to hear that, then don't go talk to those people because that's what they specialize in. You know, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, you got to go in, you know, with that knowledge, you know, so it doesn't catch you by surprise. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you know, if I was walking down the street, just passing someone on the street and they said something stupid like that, you know, then I, you know, I'd be caught by surprise. I might react a little bit differently or something. But, you know, when you go into the lion's den, expect the lion to roar. <laughs> it's just yeah. that simple. So that's number one, you know, educate yourself. And also, like, when I've been sitting there talking to some of these leaders and things like that, I've been told, uh, you know, that I'm a criminal. Um, and well, how do you know that? Well, because, let me look at your prison system. There are more black people in prison today than white people. So obviously, they are more prone to crime. So, you know, yes, it's a half truth. There are more black people in prison than white people. But they don't see the inequity. And many of them may not have the money to afford a Johnny Cochran or somebody to defend them. So they yeah. end up in this, uh, in this jail or this prison, whether they're guilty or, or maybe even not guilty and they're there. All right, so what, what these supremacists see is the net result. They don't care how they got there, they, they just know that they're there, so therefore they must be criminals. And there are more of them there than white people. So that supports their, their perspective. Mm -hmm. That's how they view it. Uh, I'm told that um, black people are lazy. We, we, uh, we prefer to scam the government welfare system than, than to get a job and do some work. And I'm told, I'm told that, uh, that black people are born with smaller brains than white people. White people have larger brains and therefore they have more capacity for IQ than we do. And that's why uh, so many blacks fail on the SATs or don't have the high scores. Where did that originate, by the way? Not to interrupt, uh, but I, it's well, in, in in their particular case, um, when I was uh, interviewing them, you know, around the first time that I was doing, I, I, mean, I, I still do it now. But when I first started, and I was hearing this, uh, a book had just come out, a worthless book, by uh, by a Dr. Charles Murray called The Bell Curve, hmm. and uh, that's what that's you know, not that they read the book. <laughs> All they had to do was was hear one excerpt from it, and then they're holding it up like the Bible. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so God. that that's where that came from. And, uh, and, but, you know, but Charles Murray was, was not the first to say that. I mean, people have said, you know, we're born with, black people are born with tails and Jews are born with horns and all that kind of stuff. You know, so he wasn't the first to say it. And he tried to prove scientifically that that was the case, you know, that we don't have um, the brain capacity or whatever. And he's wrong. But anyway, um, is what this person's saying to me offensive? Yes, it is absolutely offensive. But am I offended by it? Absolutely not. And see, that's the difference with me. I'm not taking offense to that. Why would I be offended by a lie? Mm. Somebody's telling me something about me just based on seeing this, the color of my skin. Yeah. They don't even know me. They just met me five minutes ago when we started the interview, and I'm being told this just because they see this. Yeah. So why, why would I give creed to that and get all upset over it? See, too many people... You know, they take, they internalize it and then get emotional. They want to reach across and smack somebody in the face for saying that. And then the whole project is gone down the tubes. So let them get it all out. You know who you are. How can somebody who's never met you define who you are? So I just let them finish saying it all. And then I said, okay, well, you know, that's fine. But, you know, let me just tell you so that you'll know. Number one, I don't have a criminal record. Number two, I've never been on welfare. Number three, I've never measured my brain size, but I'm sure it's the same size as yours or anybody else. <laughs> I think yours might be bigger than mine, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'll tell you what else will, will, will shut them down, which is interesting also, is the, you know, they're, they're uh, equating I, you know, high, higher IQ with larger brains. Mm -hmm. So um, the people who score the highest uh, on the SATs in our country are Chinese students. And so when I bring that up, you know, to counter, counterdict their, their superiority, they're like, so I'm saying, well, do, do Chinese people have bigger brains than you do? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> well, you know, it, it kind of changes the subject real quick. 
you know, they, you know, that's not occurring to them, but they know that. So they didn't expect me to know that, <laughs> you know? So I, I point out, it's not the brain size. It's, you know, it's somebody's work ethic or, or what's available to them. If, if they have good school systems and teachers available to them and the same, the same that's available to, to the, to the uh, white kids in, in the better schools, then, th- then there's no reason why, why black kids would fail. And chances are they wouldn't. Yeah. So it's, it's systemic, obviously. And there's, a, there's greater forces that I think are creating this inequity. Um, how, do you, how do we do the work to fix this system? Like, I love what you do, right? Because it's, it's based on what we do here at Common Ally as well. We start with dialogue. We start with the kernel of common ground. We use education as a tool to bring people together. And then we bridge build, right? I mean, you are the master of bridge building. Um, and I think there, that work should never stop. But there's also work to do from a policy standpoint and from a community standpoint and from a political standpoint. Um, what, what's your take on that? What's the work that needs Absolute, to be done there? Absolutely. You know, uh, there is no one, one you know, method fits sure. all. And a lot of people don't get that. You know, mm-hmm. so, you know, they, they might um, <laughs> criticize what I do. Um, you know, I said, you know, you should be working more with the system and, and, and the systemic and institutionalized racism. You know, you're sitting down there doing individuals and that's not helping anything, blah, blah, blah. Well, it all needs to be done. Racism is a multifaceted issue. And, you know, if, if your thing is marching in front of the police department with your bullhorn uh, or, or, or conducting sit-ins, or whatever, that's great. It needs to be done. Go do it. My thing is dealing with people one-on-one. Let me do that. But Let's all of us who are involved in this thing, let's um, coordinate and cooperate with each other. Let's not waste our time criticizing what somebody else is doing yeah. when it's been proven effective. Some things are going to be done fast. Some things are going to be done slow. It doesn't matter as long as it gets done. But we have to coordinate our effort. You know, it's like a, I, what, I, what I would compare it to is a hostage uh, situation. Hmm. You know, uh, if we, we've, we've heard all too many times, uh, some, some guy comes home, he's distraught about whatever, he lost his job or whatever, and he has a gun. Now he's holding his wife and kids hostage, and he's going to probably shoot the kids and the wife and then shoot himself. Mm-hmm. We've heard that story many times. Yeah. Okay, somebody reports that they know what's going on. Several different branches of the police come. The regular uniform cops come. And they're with their bullhorn standing multiple feet away, yelling and screaming in there, telling the guy to come out, let one of his kids out, whatever. Um, then you've got another department of the police, section of the police, they're there, the SWAT team. You know, they're on the side of your house, they're in the back of your house, the front of your house. They might even drop down from a helicopter onto, onto the roof of your house, right? And then you've got another guy from the, from the police trying to call you on the phone. You know, that's the hostage negotiator, right? Each of these people are coordinating with each other. And whoever has the, the guy on the line or has a, a, a direct clear shot to the guy or whatever, whatever he's responding to, they go with that person. You know, the, the main yeah. goal of all of those people, and they all are trained in different ways. The main goal, common goal, is to free those people who are in danger, the lady and her children, right? So if the sniper, a SWAT sniper has a bead on the guy's forehead and can take him out, without injuring anybody else in the house through the window or whatever, that guy is gone. He's dead. He's gone. Finished. Mm-hmm. Okay. If the, if the guy outside the uniform cop with the bullhorn talking to the guy and he's responding to that, everybody goes with him. If the guy on the phone, you know, is, is, is thinks he's making some headway and the guy's going to let at least one kid go, everybody goes with him. Whoever has, you know, that rapport, it's who they go with. And that's why they coordinate it. Yep. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of people uh, who are working on this racism problem, you know, don't coordinate with one another. And that might be why it's uh, taking so, so long, because, you know, we have powerful forces against us. Mm-hmm. So we cannot afford to divide ourselves. We need to cooperate and coordinate with one another. 
dialogue, just like we have with other people on the other side of the fence, we need to have that dialogue with ourselves as well. And Tifa and like Black Lives Matter and all these other like forces on, on opposite sides, you know, have their own things and they are very segmented sometimes. Um, I was wondering what that relationship looked like and if you had conflict and if you have been able to make headway in the same way you have with the Klan. Um, are you seeing positive signs that you can make headway with some of these groups who are, who are obviously trying to fight for the same thing you are? Sure. I have not pursued them as, um, as uh, much as I have pursued the white supremacists. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, anybody can be talked to, whether it's Antifa or Black Lives Matter or whatever, whatever other groups you know, may have a different, um, different method of dealing with it. Uh, I don't agree with, with violence as your first uh, resort. Certainly yeah. if somebody attacks you, you, know, you have to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with that whatsoever. I've defended myself and had to hurt people before who put their hands on me and things like that. I don't, I don't um, uh, condone violence, but I don't condemn it if, you know, if you're under attack. Yeah. But it, it should not be the first go-to. I prefer to have conversations with people. Um, you know, with, um, with now, now in, in, in many groups, uh, there, are, there is a percentage, uh, and some more than others, of, uh, of anarchists who just want to instigate and, and then sit back and watch what they've created, or they get an adrenaline kick out of getting in there and, and you know, knocking it around with people. Uh, you know, these are people who, who are simply wired that way. You know, that, that's, what, that's what gets them off. Um, that's why they're called anarchists. Uh, some of them, you know, you, have, you, know you, you pick and choose your battles. Yeah. Uh, there'll be some people who will never change on all sides. Mm -hmm. But if somebody is willing to sit down and have a conversation with you, regardless of how much they may, dis may disagree with you, there is the opportunity to plant a seed. You're not going to see that seed, you know, grow in the hour that you talk to the person or, you know, several hours or whatever, or even the next day. But it requires... First, you plant the seed, but then you got to come back and water it yes. and nurture it, and that's when the change occurs. Because you know, people start here, you know, far apart, and then the you know, even if you're on whether you're on opposite sides of the fence or or the same side of the fence, you you want the you want the common goal. Um, like for example, you know, what would I have in common with with a uh, with a KKK member or a neo-Nazi? Well, I find those common grounds. Um, for example, you want better education in schools for your kids, don't you? Sure. You want to see drugs get off the street, right? Of course. So, so do they. Yep. So even though they don't like me and, and, and I have a different ideology than they do, we have that common goal in the middle. Yep. So let's work towards that. And, and as we do that, we're coming closer and closer together. And then we're seeing that, you know what? We have... Um, more in common than we do in contrast. Yes. As we get towards that middle to what we both want. And when we get there, chances are it has affected that other person so much that the trivial things that we had in contrast, such as uh, skin color or whether we go to a church, a mosque, a synagogue, or a temple, don't matter anymore. Yeah. And, and that, that's how these things happen with me. You know, people, you know, if you, if you see my name in the media, it always, often says, you know, black musician converts X number of Klansmen or whatever. Yep. No, I do not convert anybody. I am the impetus for a great number of people leaving that movement and renouncing that ideology. But I did it by planting the seed and nurturing yeah. it. They converted themselves. I'm glad you make that distinction because it's, it's so vital that you're not, you're not going into these groups um, and trying to change minds and trying right. to bring them to your camp. Like you right. are, they're self-realizing after creating this humanized situation out of something that has been dehumanized. And I think you do that so well. So I'm glad you brought up that distinction. Well, you know, it's always more powerful when somebody comes to the conclusion themselves yeah. and, and, and changes themselves <laughs> rather than you try to force it on them. Of course, because that's not sustaining. Like right. if you, you could do that short term, maybe, but they're going to flip back and revert to what they know right. and what's comfortable. So uh, the other thing that I admire is the long-term vision. And I mean, you've been doing this 30 plus years now. Um, you know, this is not something like you said, it's not going to change overnight, but people need to know that you're invested in them long-term, whether you agree with them or not, they need to know that you care enough that you're going to see this thing through. Um, 
and part of part of what we do too, you know, our whole thing, we are called common ally for a reason. We think that there are more allies than not. We think there's more common ground than differences. Um, and our whole mantra is educate, activate, reward, right? It's not just educate. It's not just teach because then you've taught someone something and then you didn't show investment that you care that they're right. going to do something with it. Right. And I think you are the embodiment of that. So, um, yeah, I'm really, really thankful for the work you're doing on that. I agree wholeheartedly. You said uh, educate, activate, and... And reward. And reward, right. You know, education is a key for, for everything. It's, it's at the foundation. Um, I've often said that, that ignorance breeds fear, fear breeds hatred, hatred breeds destruction. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we fear the things that we don't understand, that, that of which we're ignorant. Uh, if we don't keep that fear in check, it will escalate and 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 grow into hatred because we end up hating the things that scare us. Yeah. Uh, if we don't keep the hatred in check, it will escalate and turn into into a destruction. We want to destroy the things that we hate. Why? Because they frighten us. But guess what? They may have been harmless, and we were simply ignorant. Mm -hmm. um, we saw that whole chain unravel to completion on uh, August twelfth, three years ago, two thousand. Um, I'm sorry, three. Uh, yeah three years ago in 2017 uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia, yeah. and where there was a lot of ignorance there that day. There was a lot of fear there that day. There was a lot of hatred there that day. And what did it culminate in? It culminated in destruction when a white supremacist got inside his vehicle and tried to murder as many protesters as he could by driving full speed into them. And he ended up uh, injuring 20 and, and murdering one young lady, Heather Heyer. Mm -hmm. um, so there's your whole thing. Ignorance breeds fear, fear breeds hatred, hatred breeds destruction. But, you know, we, I, my opinion, we are uh, trying to solve this problem backwards. Normally, you would apply this top down. You know, you, if you have a company or something like that, and, you know, you, you have a chain of command or whatever, and people, are, people down below are screwing up, it's usually because management is not doing their job. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to lead by example. And, and trickle down so people on the ground you know, behave accordingly. Uh, that's, that's the norm. But in this case, uh, in racism, it doesn't work that way. And, and see, we're, we're, because we're doing it wrong. For us, it has to trickle up. Um, you don't fix cancer in your bone by putting a topical cream up here. You know, you gotta drill down to the bone and inject whatever it is you're gonna put in there, radiation or chemo or whatever. Um, if we should not worry about the destruction because number one, if something is destroyed, it's not coming back. George yeah. Floyd is not, it's not coming back. All right. We should not worry about the hatred or the fear because those are just symptoms. We have to go to the source. The source is ignorance. Yes. If we, if we can cure the ignorance, that means alleviate our lack of knowledge because we're ignorant. If we can cure the ignorance, then there's nothing to fear. So we fear what we don't know. So if we know we don't fear it. Mm -hmm. So we cure the evidence, there's no fear. If there's no fear, there's nothing to hate. If there's nothing to hate, then there's nothing to destroy. So let's work on the source, on the ignorance. And you hit it on the head. There is a cure for ignorance. It's called education. So we, we educate the ignorance. We expose the ignorance to things that, that it doesn't know. So now it knows. And now there's something to fear. We, we, we invest too much energy in the symptoms rather than the source. Yep. I wholeheartedly agree with that. And I think, you know, a lot of that for me, and this is just an observation, so please tell me if I'm wrong, but, you know, knowing your background um, and knowing that, you know, you grew up at a young age, you know, living in different places throughout the globe uh, before you actually came back to the U.S. and dealt with your first bout of racism. Um, I feel like that kind of set the path for you because, a, those are the most impressionable years of your life. Um, and B, when you can submerge yourself into communities that don't look like you, that don't sound like you, that don't eat like you, um, you tend to develop empathy and understanding um, early on. So you being able to do that early, I feel like set you on a course to be able to do this type of work without having anger as the first um you know, instinct that kicks in, which it rightfully can and should, right? So um, can you talk a little bit about that? And if that has set the path for you and what, what your first interaction with racism looked like? Sure. And yes, that, you know, that's very true. And I have traveled 
uh, extensively, starting at the age of three. Uh, my, my parents were in the U.S. Foreign Service, so I spent a lot of time overseas, living and visiting many different, living in and visiting many different countries. Uh, when you combine my travels as a child with my, with my parents, uh, because of my dad's job, combined with my travels now as an adult uh, musician performing around the world, I've been in a total of 57 countries on six continents. Mm. So literally, I've been exposed to a multitude of uh, ethnicities, colors, religions, cultures, etc., cetera, uh, starting at a young age, as you pointed out. And all of that has shaped who I've become. And, you know, uh, my, my favorite quote of, of all time is by Mark Twain, and it's called The Travel Quote. And Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. And that is so true. Mm -hmm. And perhaps had I not uh, had all that travel experience and, and exposure to different cultures, would I be doing this work today? Probably not. I might have a whole different perspective. But, you know, um, my, when, when I was going to school overseas, as a kid in elementary school, uh, kindergarten, whatever, because you know you go to a country for two years, then you come home for a little while, you're back in the States, mm -hmm. and then get debriefed, and then you go on another assignment to another country for two years, back and forth, back and forth. And what did your father do? Uh, he was a, uh, a foreign service officer, State Department. Gotcha. Okay, so, so I was an American embassy brat. <laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> so you know, you heard military brats while I was a foreign service brat, yeah. embassy brat. So uh, anyway, um, when I was overseas going to school, my classes were filled with kids from all over the world, Nigeria, Italy, uh, Japan, Russia, Czechoslovakia, whoever had an embassy in those countries, all of their children, we all went to the same school. Now we're talking early 1960s, right? Yeah. So if you were to look, look into my classroom door, open the door and peep your head in the, in the, uh, in the room, you would see what you would consider to be a United Nations of little kids, because that's exactly what we were. But at the end of the two years, when we would come back home here to the States, and I would go to school, I would either be in all black schools or black and white schools, mm. meaning what? The all black school is the still segregated school. Yep. The black and white school is the newly integrated school. Because, you know, um, even though I was born in 58, I'm 62, and desegregation was ruled in 1954 yep. with Brown versus the Board of Education. It didn't happen overnight, as we've talked about. Yeah, I mean, and even I into think the that's 60s, a, <laughs> yeah, that's a great misconception that like just exactly, mag exactly. a magic wand was lifted and that was the date that everything got great. Well, yeah, and, and that misconception is still around. People say, oh, mm -hmm. I thought we were over racism when we got Obama in the White House. Yeah, you, know, you think some magic switches flip. Yeah. Or <laughs> you know, no. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I would either be, you know, in the still segregated school or the newly integrated one. And there was not the amount of diversity in my classroom here in the States that I had overseas, right? It was either all black kids or black and white kids. You know, we didn't see a lot of Hispanics or, um, or uh, East Indian or, in, you know, anything else, Japanese, yep. whatever. Um, like we do today when you walk into a classroom. So I was already prepared for, for diversity. I came from a multicultural environment. Yep. Um, you know, my, my, my peers were not, they were not prepared for it. And so when, um, when, when I came back one time in 1968, I was age 10 in the uh, fourth grade, we were in a place called Belmont, uh, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. right outside of Boston. Yep. And I was one of two black kids in the entire school. I was in fourth grade and there was a little black girl in second grade. So the only time I ever saw her was at recess or uh, lunchtime in the cafeteria. And, uh, so, you know, and you know, even when I saw her, you know, I, I didn't have any, really anything to do with her any more so than I would do with any second graders. Cause you know, I'm, I'm a big, bad fourth grader. I don't, so, I don't associate with the underclassmen, right? <laughs> yes. So uh, the hierarchy of, of right, elementary school. Right. <laughs> exactly. So all of my friends were like, you know, fourth and fifth graders. And, uh, a lot of the uh, the guys in my class were uh, Cub Scouts. And, you know, I was the new kid on the block. I just come. And they invited me to join. So I joined the Cub Scouts. 
got my uniform, everything was cool. And um, we had a march from uh, Lexington to Concord, which is right next door to Belmont, yeah. to, to commemorate the ride of uh, Paul Revere. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I think the 4-H club, the Girl Scouts, Brownies, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, and whatever other organizations. I was the only black scout in this thing. And the streets were blocked off, sidewalks on either side, lined with white people. They're cheering and waving flags and yelling the British are coming and all that kind of thing. And somewhere down this parade march, this route, uh, suddenly I began getting hit with uh, pebbles, rocks, and uh, bottles, soda pop cans, that kind of thing. And it was just a small group of white people off to my left, off to my right, rather. Um, maybe four or five people. But I do remember there were a couple of kids and a couple of adults who were throwing, excuse me, who were throwing things. And my, my first reaction, my first inclination was, those people over there don't like the scouts. That's how naive I was. Hmm. Um, it did not occur to me that I was the only scout getting hit until my, my, my uh, scout leaders came running and like, covered me with their bodies and escorted me out of the danger. And these are all white people who were you know, doing this and protecting wow. me. And um, I kept saying, why? why? Why are they hitting me? I didn't say anything to them. I didn't, I didn't do anything. That, Shh, shh, move along, Daryl. Here, move along, move along, move along. Hmm. It'll be okay. So that kind of rushed me out of the danger. And nothing more was said. They never answered my question, why, why is this happening? And so when I got home, which was like shortly thereafter, uh, my parents were not at the parade. And um, they see me and they're asking me, how did I fall down and get all scraped up? and they're cleaning me up, putting band-aids on me. And I told them I didn't fall down. I told them precisely what had happened. Yeah. And after they finished cleaning me up, they sat me down and explained to me what racism was. Now, you're gonna find this amazing, but it's not, it's not that I'm stupid, it's just that I'm, I was naive. I had never heard the word racism wow. at the age of 10, never heard it. I had no reason to. Yeah. I've been around people from all over the world not just my neighborhood, you know, here in the States or something, from all over the world, and nobody had ever treated me like that. I had seen every color under the sun, and nobody had treated me like that. Hmm. So I, I had no reason to, to know anything about racism, right? Yeah. So now they're, they're telling me this stuff, and I could not process it. My 10-year-old my, my brain could not wrap itself around what they were telling me. Uh, and... I, I had always, always believed my parents. I'm an only child. So if I had problems, I went to them. If I had questions, I went to them. And either they answered them or solved them or gave me the tools by which I could do it myself. Nice. Okay. And when they were telling me this stuff, that it's because of the color of my skin, some people just don't like other people because of that, blah, blah, blah. I did not believe them. I thought they were lying to me. Of course, I thought it was a joke, you know, you know what, what's the real deal here? And, you know, they, they, they held this, this facade, you know, that I thought, you know, they were holding. And then I figured out, you know, they're lying to me. There's something, you know, they don't want me to know. Uh, I just could not accept it because I could not understand how somebody who had never seen me, somebody who had never spoken to me, someone who knew nothing about me would want to hurt me just for no reason in the color of my skin. And, and it made no sense. And to evidence it that it made no sense was the fact that I knew hundreds at that point, hundreds of white people. Yeah. Um, whether they were my little French friends, my German friends, my Swedish friends, my Czechoslovakian friends, or my fellow Americans from the embassy who were white. None of them treated me that way. And for that matter, my friends right there in Belmont from my, my, my scouts and their families, they didn't treat me that way. So it cannot be the color of your skin. You're lying to me. Hmm. What, what is it? Because I, I have this precedent of, of being around white people who had never done yeah. this to me, right? So, Which uh, is I also, it's, sorry, just timeline-wise, I mean, it's absolutely amazing that, you know, this is Emmett Till, this is Rosa Parks, this is the, the upswell of what, you know, spawned the Civil Rights Movement and going into the Civil Rights Act and all that. Like, you're, you're becoming a child during that time. Right. And you're doing it around the world. So uh, it's fascinating to think that all of that is happening and, and you're able to be insulated by that because of the diversity around you to only come back to your home country and have it smack you in the face. I mean, it's... So, you know, you know had I not done all that traveling and had all that exposure, um, 
prior, had my first interaction with a white people, with a, with a white person or a group of white people, then getting rocks and bottles thrown at me, maybe I'd have a whole different take. Yeah. You know, but because I had that precedent, you know, of people treating me well, then um, it, it, it didn't make any sense to me. And of course, racism does not make any sense because mm -hmm. there's nothing logical about it. Um, my, my mother uh, had a, I mean, super phobia of dogs. I, I, I was never allowed to have a dog when, uh, growing up. I mean, she was terrified. It could be a, a little baby puppy chihuahua or poodle that was born yesterday or this morning. She would not go anywhere near it. All right. Um, my grandfather explained it to me that, you know, when she was a little girl, he had a hunting dogs or something. And, and she was like five or something. And one of them bit her. And from that day forward, it, that was it. You know, even years later when she got married and had me. You know, she still had a phobia of dogs. I mean, we'd walk down the street and somebody have, have a little poodle on a leash, a short leash. She'd make me cross the street and walk with her. She would not go, not pass on the sidewalk. Uh. That bad. You know, and then every time, you know, we got invited to a party, my father would have to call, you know, do you have dogs at the house? Is it possible to keep the dog, you know, in the outside or in the bedroom or something like that? Or my mom would not come. Uh. So I, you know, I had been around dogs. My friends, you know, had dogs, my playmates. And I loved dogs. I was never allowed to have one. And so, um, I, you know, I'd always go and play with their dogs. And then one day, my mom and this lady went shopping. And my mom had taken me over to the lady's house uh, because uh, she had a little daughter about my age. And, and they had a babysitter and so forth. And so I was going to be watched by this babysitter and I could play with the little girl while our moms are out shopping. And when I got there, there was this German shepherd out on the balcony. And because um, they lived in an apartment. And the lady specifically told me, my, my friend's mom told me, Daryl, you know, do not go out on the balcony. You know, she named the dog about what his dog's name was. But anyway, the dog is very mean. It will bite. So do not, you know, go out there and, and try to play with it. Hmm. Oh, okay. So they left, left us in the hands of, 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 the, of the housekeeper, the nanny. And um, I'm playing with a little girl and the dog is out there on the balcony, you know, watching us through the, through the sliding glass door. Yeah. And you know, it didn't look mean. And so I said to the little girl, I said, why is your doggy so mean? She says, my doggy isn't mean. <laughs> and she goes out there and she was like petting it and playing with it. It's like licking her all over her face. I think, you know, that lady lied to me. So I walk out there to play with it. That thing knocked me over, jumped on me, bit me from head to toe. I mean, tore me up. The nanny had to come out and pull the dog off me, oh my God. literally. Yeah. I mean, I was ripped to shreds. You know, I was like, you know, I'm six years old or something. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, I mean, I survived it, but I was never afraid of dogs afterwards. Mm -hmm. I, I, I associated this, this, this thing to that particular dog. I mean, I wasn't even afraid of German shepherds. I might've had a little trepidation when, I, when I'd hear the name German shepherd, but it didn't deter me from other dogs and, and, and German shepherds, you know, that were friendly. Yeah. And then, of course, later, you know, I always grew up liking dogs. And then when my mom died, I got a dog. That's so, you know, so, you know, you see, you see somebody whose first experience with dogs is getting bit and it carries them the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. And somebody else who has experience with dogs um, gets bit, but doesn't, you know, become uh, prejudiced towards these dogs. So that, that's the difference. Yeah. And like, and like I said, you know, it had, had that, that, that rock, rock and bottle throwing thing been my first experience. It might be a different, different Daryl Davis today. I, first of all, you're the master of anecdotes, buddy, by the way. And I absolutely, it paints the picture of things so clearly. Um, and that it's riveting to hear in that, in that light. Um, and I feel like not everyone's able to do that. And you always hear these stories of like, well, my dad lost his job to affirmative action and therefore see, there's my case. Like, and they do, they carry that um, with them and it just gets regurgitated and regurgitated and then passed down to other people. And I feel like that's a part of what like creates some of the systematic racism um, and not to transition too far out. Cause I want to go deeper into your backstory here. Um, but how, you know, find something that fits your narrative. I, you know, you said that earlier. How in the world of social media and, you know, do we, are we able to, to take the story that you just told 
and be able to have more people tell stories like that. You know, I got bit by the dog and, but I don't hate all dogs and I don't hate all German shepherds. I was able to not let that dictate the rest of my path with social media kind of reinforcing a lot of this every day. How do we combat that and tell more stories like you're telling? Well, just that way, keep telling those stories on social media. And then, I mean, I've told similar stories. I haven't told the dog story, but I've told similar stories. Next thing I know, it's being shared all over the place. Yeah. Because there's a positive outcome. You know, so, you know, we want to, to, to share positive things. And, and uh, but, but point out the negativity that can happen. You know, if things go in another direction. And next thing you know, somebody will relate to it. It's just like, you know, when, when, some, when some woman gets um, sexually harassed or raped by, by a fellow employee or her boss or something like that, you know, she's very hesitant to talk about it. And for good reason. You know, she might, she might get uh, a re- retaliation or she might get re-victimized if she goes to court and they put her on the stand or whatever. Uh, so she doesn't really come forward. And then, and then somebody else, you know, gets it. You know, and, and they decide, you know what, well, you know, I'm not standing for this. I'm, I'm going to expose this. And, they, and, and she does. And the next thing you know, here comes a whole string of them saying, well, that happened to me, you know, five years ago. And he did it to me last week and da, 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 da. And now you've got this whole bevy of people uh, affirming, you know, what had happened. Some of them may be in it for the glory and nothing ever happened. And, and then there, there are those who, yes, it did happen. And they didn't come forward when it did, but it did happen. So um, when you tell these stories on social media, it will resonate with somebody. Yeah. And then there'll be those who, who, who will still hold back and say, good, I'm glad you're telling the story. I don't have the, the guts to do it. You know, and then there are those who will be triggered, say, you know what, that happened to me too. And then they want to tell their story and then it gets shared. Yeah. So that's what happens. So that's why we have the Me Too movement, yep. which is a good thing. Yeah, you know, and I'm glad you brought that up. And it, I think there's there's really similar parallels and you know, the trauma, the trauma that a situation like that can cause. um, Yes. You can be uh, you know, outside forces can kind of condemn you for doing it, but it's really internally too. That's a very personal traumatic thing um, that is not easy to deal with. And it's not easy to come public with, you know, let alone. So whenever people say, well, why did you wait so long? Like it makes my blood boil because there's very obvious reasons why people wait. Um, But to your point, um, when someone is able to break through that and come out and say something, it does show that you're not alone and you're able to kind of rally behind someone who is standing for you. So um, I think we see that with racism and with the Me Too movement. So, And what we're seeing today you. that's much different than we've been seeing in years and decades past. There have always been a lot of white people who've been involved with our, with our civil rights uh, protests. You know, even back to the days of Martin Luther King, you know, there've been white people involved. But today, we're seeing a lot more of the people that we're accusing of of, of uh, mistreating us joining in with with our with our uh, protests and marches, mm-hmm. which is a good thing because for decades we've been complaining, we've been telling people the police are doing this uh, long before video cameras. We were saying this, and people were like. No, 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 please don't do that. You know, you, mu- you must have done something wrong to get hit in the head with the nightstick. You know, yeah. well, what were you doing? I wasn't doing anything but sitting in my car, you know, whatever. Well, you had to be doing something because the cops don't do things like that. I and mean, even after Rodney King, the cops don't do things like that. You know, that's some anomaly or whatever. Um, but now everybody has, a, has a, a video camera on their hip in the form of a cell phone, yep. you know? So people see more and more of that. But still, the voices, our voices are being shut down. And now we got people who look like us who are seeing the same things and recognizing it and saying enough is enough. Yeah. And so now the voice, the, you know, we're getting heard. If you look at, uh, at George Floyd, for example, uh, that, that case, that officer, uh, Derek Chauvin, he had 18 complaints yeah. against him in his 19 year career on the police force. That's almost what a complaint a year. Right. Yep. So, Apparently, 18 people, 18 voices spoke up. If the authorities had listened, perhaps, to just one of those 18 people who complained and, 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 and uh, checked him, 
he may have modified his behavior and wouldn't be in this situation today. Yep. But, but they didn't listen to one, two, they didn't, they didn't listen to not, not one of those 18 voices and now half the country is on fire, literally. Yep. Okay. So when, you know, when people, when people, you know, speak up, they speak up for a reason and they realize when you speak up against the police, you're putting yourself in some danger. Yeah. Okay. You're putting yourself in, in some danger because there could be retaliation, you know, and then everybody knows who you are. All right. And so, the, you know, the police have supporters and they support them, the, each other and all that kind of thing. And if they're, and I can guarantee you, just like the women who, uh, who get harassed or raped, a lot of them don't report it. You know, if, if, the, uh, if, the, if your town uh, comes out with their police report at the end of the year and says, the town of wherever you are, uh, we had 32 um, uh, murders in this, in this city uh, in 2020, and we had um, 16 rapes, I'll guarantee you that there may be have been 32 murders, but there were a lot more than 16 rapes because yep. there are some women who don't report it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if there are 18 complaints against that guy, officially, there are probably more that have not been reported because people are afraid to go talk about the police. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, this week has been a great example of that. Like, obviously, what happened to George Floyd has been the catalyst for the boil over, for the people saying enough, right? And for marching in the streets and for everything that's come from that. But what it's also done is spark the stories where someone didn't die, but deals with it daily, right? That has to deal with this, that no death might not be the outcome, but the outcome on a daily basis is that you are other and that you are less and that you have to deal with the situation on a regular basis. Uh, and, and that is fucked up. Um, yeah, indeed. Indeed. But look at, look at uh, that, that girl, um, Amy, Amy Cooper, mm -hmm. the one in the park with the dog, yep. right? You know, she, she was not threatened and she did not feel threatened either. Okay, because you saw her walk up on him and point her finger in his face and say, stop recording me. Turn, your, turn that off. Yep. Okay, uh, you know, if, if I'm scared of somebody and somebody's threatening me, I'm not going to walk up in their face, especially if I'm a girl and, and, the, and the, the threatener is, is yeah. a guy. I'm and a bird in, watcher at that. And a bird not watcher. Really you know, for no, exactly. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to walk up in their face and point my finger at them. You know, and, and you know, when somebody feels threatened, what do they try to, you know, what do they do if, if they're in fear of their life? They try to get away. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they walk in the, up, in the other direction. All right, she didn't even do that. What, what she said, I'm, I'm gonna tell you what she said, and then I'm gonna tell you what I heard, all right, and what every black person heard. Mm -hmm. um, she said, I'm gonna call the police and tell them an African -Amer American man is threatening my life. She didn't say, I'm going to call the police and tell them that a man is threatening my life. She said African-American man. Yep. Because she knows the history of blacks and the police. And usually uh, it, it, the result is death. Mm -hmm. Okay. If there's a confrontation, especially a confrontation between a black man and a white female, it's not a good outcome. All right. So she, in other words, she was threatening his yeah. life. I'm going to call the police on you and you know what's going to happen when they come and see that you're black and you threaten this, you know, this white girl. That's what I was hearing. Yeah. That's what every black person was hearing. Yeah. All right? So she's, you know, she, and, and then she feigned that, that, that she was, you know, in some kind of danger. Her voice got elevated and all that kind of stuff. She was p putting on her little act. Um, you know, it's African American man, you know, he's threatening the life, my life and the life of my dog and blah, blah, blah. You know, Oh. If, if it had been a white guy um, who had told her to put, to put the dog on the leash and she got all indignant, she would not have said, um, I'm, I'm calling the police and telling them a white man is threatening my, my life. And she would not have called the police and said, uh, there's a white man in Central Park in the, in the Ramble who's threatening my life. She, would, she just would have said, there's a man who's threatening my life. Yeah. I mean, that's the epitome of privilege right there. Yeah. She's, yeah. Fully, she's using information as a weapon. She knows what's going to happen. Um, Honestly, I mean, that it's almost attempted murder. Like, obviously, I don't want to go too far down that road, but she, she knows that's a, a likely possibility that yeah. could potentially happen, that this man can lose his life because of what she is doing and orchestrating falsely. Uh, the only person threatened there besides the poor man who was involved with that is the dog who was being strangled uh, for every two <laughs> seconds of that video as well. Exactly. Um, but 
and it's in that too, to your point before that, you know, how many Amy Coopers are in Central Park right now doing the same thing that just isn't, wasn't recorded or wasn't talked about. Like, you know, it's, it is the system. It is going to the source to your, to, to what you said earlier, we have to fix the things that make Amy Cooper feel comfortable doing that. And for making it, all of those kinds of situations um, likely on a daily basis. So. Um, and she may not be a bad person. Otherwise, if she has kids, she's probably good to her kids. Perhaps mm-hmm. she's good to her parents. She's, she's a good worker at her job or whatever. All, you know, all the, so, you know, I, I know clan people, who other than their ideology are good, decent people. Yeah. Okay. But they have that twisted ideology that needs to be fixed and it can be fixed. If something can be learned, it can be unlearned. It's in it. Yes. Great, great point. And it's not just can be, it has to be. Right. I think we, a lot of the work you do and a lot of work, anyone in this space of bridge building, right? It's, we can't throw people away, right? We all have family members who are either racist or feel a certain way about this or we don't, we don't link up politically, whatever that is. We have to work at that. We can't just say, well, you're not my uncle anymore. And you know, you're not my sister anymore. Like we, right. we have to do this work. And I think I've heard you say that before too, that it's your duty. It's our obligation. Look, I've said it before. Our, our country, our society can only become one of two things. One, it can become that which we sit back and let it become. Or two, it can become that which we stand up and make it. So we all have a, have a personal question that we each have to answer. And the question is, do I want to sit back and see what my country becomes? Or do I want to stand up and make it become what I want to see? And that's a personal decision. I've chosen the latter, to stand up and see what I can do to make it become what I want to see. You know, and that's what those protesters yeah. out there in the street were doing. Yep. I do want to talk about the work you do with the clan. Um, sure. Obviously this is huge. Um, and I want to talk about music too in, okay. your, in your life there. Cause I'm super fascinated. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what led you down this path of, uh, and I believe you were, you were a musician professionally. That was what you I were doing. Yeah. yeah. And, and that was kind of, uh, I think at least where your life was headed and then something happened and all of a sudden you're going to clan rallies. So can you, can you, that's a wild storyline right there. <laughs> On my way to a gig. Yeah. <laughs> so can you just tell our audience what that, what that Well, was? actually what I just said is true. Mm-hmm. I, I would stop by clan rallies and clan people's houses on my way to gigs. And my band would like freak out because, you know, they'd be riding with me in my, in my band van. And then it got to the point where they were like, uh, Daryl, I'll, I'll just meet you at the gig. <laughs> they, they didn't want to. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, I, I'd always been fascinated with racism ever since that that uh, incident at age ten, and uh, and, and then I, you know, in teenage years, I had other incidents as well, and so uh, at the age of ten, I had formed that question in my mind: uh, How can you hate me if you don't even know me? And mm. you know, because I said I was baffled that somebody would just hate me just because of the color of my skin when I hadn't done anything and they, and they knew nothing about me. So uh, in my young years, my, my beginning teenage years, I began buying a lot of books on black supremacy, white supremacy, anti-Semitism, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, the Nazis in Germany, the neo-Nazis over here, just trying to learn where does that come from? How can it be addressed? It's, where's it going? All the kind of stuff. But none of those books answered the question as to why why people um, hate uh, people just because of the color of their skin. They all talked about it, but they didn't give me a satisfactory answer. So I was still searching that answer. Well, uh, I, I got my degree in music, in performance, and I graduated college and you know, started playing professionally. That's, that's all I've done. And so uh, country music had made a comeback. There had been this movie, Urban Cowboy, with uh, John Travolta, this mechanical bull, yeah. and all these line dances and stuff. So all the bars that were playing top 40 switched their format over to country. And so I joined a country band because I wanted, I wanted to work full time, not just play once or twice a month. So, you know, yeah. so, you know whatever was being played mostly was what I would be playing. So uh, I joined this country band and I was the only black guy in the band, only black guy in most of the places where we played. And there was this bar called the Silver Dollar Lounge up in uh, Frederick, Maryland, which is about an hour and, and a few minutes outside of DC, mm-hmm. Washington, DC. And so the Silver Dollar Lounge was a truck stop bar 
it's at the confluence of, of these two highways. There's a big truck stop plaza with an all night restaurant, a motel, the bar in the bottom of the motel, a mechanics bay to work on the interstate truckers and all that trucks. So anyway, uh, it was also known as an all white lounge. Not that it advertised that way or anybody said you couldn't come in, no. Um, what all, year is this? This is back in the 80s. Okay. And uh, 1983, to be precise. And um, nobody said you couldn't come in, but, uh, but, but uh, black people knew to stay out of there. They were not welcome, so they didn't go, and which is a good idea. Because, you know, when you go somewhere where you're not welcome and, uh, and alcohol is being served, yeah. it's, it's not a good combination. Yeah, there's no way now there. Yep. Right. So um, here I was in this place. Now, the band was, was an established country band in the area. And, uh, you know, they played there a bunch of times, my first time in there. And um, we did, a, you know, we, we do three sets a night. After the first set, uh, we came off the bandstand on break, and I'm following them over to some band table. And I felt somebody come up behind me and put his arm around my shoulder. Now, I see the entire band in front of me, and I don't know anybody in this place, so who the hell is touching me? I you know, turn around to oh. look, and uh, it's this guy. And he's like a white guy, of course. And um, he's 15, 18 years, you know, significantly older than me. And I was 25 at the time. And um, he's smiling and he's happy. And he says, man, I really enjoy your all's music. He's hugging me. And uh, I shake his hand. I say, thank you. I appreciate that. And then he points at the stage and he says, I've seen this here band before, but I ain't never seen you before. Where'd you come from? And I explained to him, yeah, you, know, you probably did see the band before because they've played here before. They've told me. But I just joined the band two months ago. This is my first time. He goes, man, I sure like your piano playing. This is the first time I ever heard a black man play piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. <laughs> so I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't um, <laughs> offended, but, but I was kind of shocked that because given this guy's age, you know, he's older than me. So he, he grew up closer to the area, an area to the era that, uh, that Jerry Lee had his heyday. You know, with great balls of fire and a whole lot of yeah. shaking and all that stuff, right? He's and, clearly not a music historian, though. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but but you know, but you would have thought, uh, you know, you would have thought at least he he he'd heard or, or seen Little Richard or Fancy Domino that plays the same genre of music, and they both are black. Mm -hmm. So I was surprised that he didn't know Jerry Lee's black origin of uh, of musical, um, you know, uh, what he liked. And um, I said to him, I said, well, "Where do you think Jerry Lee Lewis learned how to play?" And he says. Well, what you talking about? And I, I explained to him the black origin. I said, the same place I learned. He goes, no, 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 no. Jerry Lee ain't never learned, learned from no black people. You know, I, I never heard no black person play piano like that, so for you. And so um, I, I said, look, I know him. He's told me himself where he learned how to play. I don't, you know, he ain't learned anything with no black people. The guy thought I was, I was pulling his leg, like yeah. I thought my parents were pulling my leg, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, but he was fascinated enough that he, he wanted to, to bring me back to his table to have a drink with him, he was gonna buy me a drink. Now I don't drink alcohol, but I went back to his table, still just, you know, totally unaware of who he was or what he was or anything like that. And uh, he had a buddy sitting with him and he called the waitress over and um, he ordered me what I wanted, I wanted a cranberry juice. She brought it back, he paid for it. Then he took his glass and he clinks my glass and cheers me. He says, you know, as though he's celebrating something. This is the first time I've ever sat down and had a drink with a black man. Now I'm kind of, you know, like, okay, uh, what's this all about? <laughs> Thank you. Uh. <laughs> but you know, I, I wasn't afraid. I wasn't scared. I was, I was just kind of shocked mm -hmm. because in my 25 years, I had sat down with literally thousands of white people or anybody else and had a meal, a, a conversation, a beverage, whatever. And this guy had never done that before. And he's that much older than me, you know? Uh, so innocently, I asked him, I said, why? And he didn't answer me. He like looked down at the tabletop. I asked him again, and then his buddy elbowed him and said, tell him, tell him, tell him. I said, tell me. And he looked, because I'm thinking, what's, what's the mystery? You know, where, where's this guy been? Yeah. He's been locked up or something? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, am I sitting, you know, sitting down with a mass murderer who just got out or what? <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, I'm just not tuning in. Because, you know, listen, you remember I said earlier, you know, one's perspective is one's reality. Mm -hmm. yep. So, you know, I've been around all kinds of people. And so I didn't really have any reason to think. So I, I, I thought everybody had been around all kinds of people. That's my perspective, right? Yeah. And so that was my reality. 
And uh, anyway, so um, he, he looked up at me, you know, I said, tell me. And um, he looked up at me and he says, I'm a member of the Ku Klux Klan. So just a straight deadpan face, wow. you know? And I looked at him and I started laughing at him. I just burst out laughing because I did not believe him. Just like I didn't believe my parents. I did not believe him because like I told you, I have all, I have a vast library of books on the Klan. I read them all. And what he, his actions did not, were not congruent with, with what's in my books. Yeah. You know, they didn't talk about clans people who hug black people and praise their talents and want to hang out with them and buy them a drink. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. So uh, you know, this guy is pulling one over on me. You know, he's, you know, he thinks I'm, I'm, I'm jerking him about Jerry Lee. So he's going to jerk me about the clan. So I'm laughing. I'm going off with Joe. I'm laughing. And he goes inside his pocket, pulls out his wallet, flips through it, and hands me his clan membership card. I didn't yeah. know that was a thing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They, they pay dues, all that kind of stuff. So they have, you know, membership cards. So he hands me this card. I'm like, ooh, I recognize the, the Ku Klux Klan insignia, which is a red circle with a white cross and a blood drop in the center. Mm. And I, I realized, you know, this is for real. And so now I'm wondering why am I sitting here? So yeah. I handed it back to the guy. And, you know, we talked about the Klan. We talked about different things. And he was very, very friendly. You know, I, I didn't feel, you know, that I was being threatened or I wasn't going to make it out of there or anything like that. You know, we just had a good conversation. And so he gave me his phone number and he asked me that I call him whenever this band was to return to the Silver Dollar because he wanted to bring his friends, meaning Klansmen and Klanswomen to see this black guy play piano like Jerry Lee. So you know, he, to, to him, I was a novelty and he wanted to, to share me. So I said, I'll call you. And we were on a rotate, we, we got on a rotation with, with other bands. So we were there like every six weeks on the weekend, Friday and Saturday. And uh, I would call him on a Wednesday or a Thursday and say, hey man, we were playing down Silver Dollar, come on out. He would come both nights, Friday and Saturday. He'd bring Klansmen and Klanswomen. They came in, you know, regular street attire. Yeah, and uh, they would dance to our music, um, and they watch. They got around the, near the stage and like you know watch we play, and then on the break, you know, I would mingle with people and I'd make my way over to his table and say hello. Some of them would hang there because they they genuinely wanted to meet me, and see what I was all about and, and how is this guy doing this because they never <laughs> seen a black guy play piano like Jerry Lee either. <laughs> but others would get up when they saw me coming and scoot off, you know, to some other part of the room. You know, and so it was obvious, you know, they wanted to look at me, but, you know, look, but do not touch or don't, yeah. look, or don't talk to. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was, I was cool. So, you know, th this went on until the end of the year and um, I quit the band and I went back to playing blues and rock and roll and whatever else was going on. And then um, it you know, hadn't occurred to me yet. I mean, I lost track of the guy because I had no reason you know, like say I had a day off. I'm not going to run up to Frederick and hang out with the clan, <laughs> yeah. you know? <laughs> so That's not your idea of fun? No, no. So, uh, I mean, it is now, yeah. but, uh, but it, it wasn't then. It kind of is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is, yeah. But, um, but it wasn't then. And so, uh, anyway, you know, I, I lost track of the guy. I had no reason to call him, check on him, anything like that. And then um, it, it dawned on me, wait a minute, you know what, that, that guy, you know, the answer to my question that's been plaguing me mm. since I was 10 fell right into my lap. It fell right into my lap because who better to ask, how can you hate me when you don't even know me, than to ask someone who would go so far as to join an organization that practices hating people yep. who don't look like them and who don't believe as they believe. So I need to get back in contact with that guy. And you know, he, he was friendly to me. He, he talked about anything under the sun. So I can ask him and I would get my answer. Better yet, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get him to hook me up with the Klan leader here. I knew, I knew who he was. I'd never seen him, I never met him. I saw him on TV, I saw him in the paper. But um, I wanted to meet him. I said, you know what, I'm gonna write a book. And I, I'm gonna interview people here in Maryland, the Klan, go up north, go down south, go to the Midwest, go to the West and uh, interview different people because there had been no books written on the Klan by black authors. Mine would be the first. Mm. There had been two books written by black authors that dealt with the Klan, but each one detailed how he escaped a, a lynch mob and, um, and, and wrote about that in, in their books. Wow. So, but not from the perspective of sitting down face to face 
and interviewing their uh, prospective lynchers. Yeah. That's what I wanted to do. So uh, I was making plans to do that. And then my mother passed. And so everything got put on hold and, um, you know, got, you know, go through all that and all that kind of thing. And I just set it aside for a while. And then I, you know, when I was feeling, you know, more into it, I decided, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm going to pursue this project now. And so I had to dig around, dig around um, for that guy's phone number. You know, I, you know, we didn't have cell phones back then. We just put it in. Mm-hmm. And so I found a little piece of paper that I'd, I'd put it on. And um, I called. And the number was disconnected. So, wow. So it took me a while. I had to track him down. And it turns out he didn't have a phone, but he had moved. And so um, I got an address on him. And there was no way for me to contact him to let him know I wanted to talk to him. I wanted to see him. So I showed up at his apartment uh, one evening, you know, unannounced. Because I had no way of letting him know. Oh. So, you know, I mean, you nervous? Are you scared? Like, what does that feel like? No, I mean, this is, this is my friend, you know, who yeah. a dollar who bought me a drink, right? But you had never, and, uh, like, gone to his house, though, right? No, like, no, but I, level. yeah, it is a different level. But, but you know, I, I just don't think of things like, like the, in terms of that. Yeah. You know, yeah, I, I just think of him as just another human being with a different perspective. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's my naivete, Great. I guess. So, anyway, so I, I go to his apartment one evening, knock on the door. And the dude was there. He opens the door. He's like, Daryl, you know, what are you doing here, man? He steps out of his apartment and he like looks up and down the hallway. You know, like, like, so I brought somebody with me or something. Well, when he stepped out of his apartment, I stepped in. And he turns around, he comes back in. He goes, what's going on? Are you still playing? What's going on? I said, yeah, 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 I'm still playing. But listen, I need to talk to you about the clan. He's like, the clan? <laughs> I said, Yeah. And I guess he thought I was, I was there to bust him or something. And um, I said, yeah, you know, you're a member, right? And he says, well, I was. And he went into this long story as, as to why he had quit the clan. He had quit the clan in the interim. And that's a story in itself, funny as, as hell. I'll get to that in a minute. But um, so anyway, he, I, I asked him, you know, where all his clan stuff was. And he says, you mean my Robin Hood? And I said, yeah. He says, well, they came and got it. And I said, what do you mean they came and got it? Don't you own your Robin Hood? And he went into this story, which I later found it to be true, uh, that, you know, when you join the clan, if you can afford it, you pay out, out front for your Robin Hood and your handbook and other things that, you know, that come along you know, with the program or whatever. And, uh, <laughs> Man. yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, and you take it home and it's yours to keep. But if you cannot afford all the stuff, you can still take it all home, but you put extra money in every dues period until you pay it off. Right. Well, he had not paid off his Robin Hood, so they came and they repoed it. And um, when he when they came to get it, he could not find the mask that covered the face that attaches to the hood. And he had since found it, and he had to return it. So I said, "Let me see it." So he went down the hall t- to his bedroom or some bedroom back there, and he returned with this mask, and he hands it to me. I'm looking at this thing. I said, "Listen, do you know Roger Kelly?" Now, Roger Kelly at the time was the Grand Dragon which means state leader. Imperial wizard means national leader. So he was a state leader from Maryland. I said, you know Roger Kelly? Yeah, I know Roger. Roger was my grand dragon, blah, blah, blah. And um, I said, well, listen, um, I need you to hook me up with Mr. Kelly. I'm going to write a book on the Klan. I want to interview him. Oh, Daryl, I can't do that, man. Why not? We'll get in trouble. Yeah, but, but, you're, no, but you're no longer in the Klan. It doesn't matter. I cannot take a black man to the Grand Dragon. We both will be getting, will be getting in trouble. And he didn't want to do it. I said, well, look, you said that you got to return this mask, right? He says, yeah. I said, give me Roger Kelly's phone number and address, and I will go to his house, and I'll return it for you. He went, boom, snapped that thing right out of my hand. And he says, no way. I mean, he was genuinely um, frightened by even the prospect of me doing this. And so I had to beg and plead 20 minutes with this guy to give me Roger Kelly's uh, information. And he, he finally gave it to me on the condition that I not tell Mr. Kelly where I got it. I said, okay. So he told me about a place up there in that county where the Klan hangs out, and I could probably find Roger Kelly there on a Saturday evening. Um, and I'd be safer to go there on public property to, to approach him rather than go on his property. He warned yeah. him, he said, do not, do not go on his property. He will kill you. And then he said, 
um, that he would not guarantee that uh, Roger Kelly would even talk to me in the public place, but I'd be safer there than to go on his property. I said, okay. And so long story short, I did go to that place. I didn't go there on a Saturday. I went there on a Sunday and he wasn't there, but he did hang out there. And uh, so I missed him. So I had my, uh, my secretary give him a call. And now I could have called him myself. I did not want to call him myself. Uh, because, and I'm the one who had the phone number because I figured, you know, as much hatred as this guy has, like the guy told me, you know, he'd kill me or whatever, um, that he might detect in my voice mm. that I'm black. So I'm not talking to you. Click. And then, you know, my whole project would have ended before it ever got off the ground. So uh, my secretary um, was white lady, Mary, she, who's passed on now. But um, anyway, um, I wanted her to call him because I knew that he would know by her voice that this is a white lady. Mm. And, and I knew the mentality that he would not automatically draw a conclusion that this white lady is working for a black man, especially a black man who's writing a book on the Klan, because yeah. they don't exist. So I told her, give him a call, tell him that um, you're, you know, you're working for this, you know, your boss is writing a book on the Klan, and would he consent to giving your boss an interview? However, do not tell Roger Kelly that I'm black. And she understood and said, okay. I said, don't even allude to it. Well, what, what happens if he asked me? Well, you know, what color you are. I said, well, if he asks you, don't lie to him. Tell him the truth. But try to avoid going in that direction. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So now another reason why I did not want him to know that I was black, other than he might, he might turn me down, was that if he accepted my request, knowing that I was black, in the interim, he may prepare different answers for anticipated questions from a black uh, interviewer than he, would, than he would from a white interviewer. Yeah. So I wanted it to be spontaneous and candid. So that's why I did all the cloak and dagger stuff or whatever. And um, she understood. So she called him. She got a hold of him. And uh, she, he didn't ask what color I was. And he agreed to do the interview. So, in fact, he even invited us to his home. But I had to change the date, uh, like, like the day before something else came up. And so uh, at the date change, I told her, I said, listen, let, let's not go to his house. Let's, let's reschedule it. I mean, let's uh, change the location. Let's, let's uh, change it to, to the uh, truck stop motel the motel above the lounge mm. and you know, that's, that's close enough to him. And so, so we did, and we set it up for a Sunday uh, evening at five fifteen in the evening. And she and I got there early and uh, I gave her some money, sent her down the hallway to get soda pop out of the um, machine and put it in the ice bucket filled with ice, get it all cold. So I would be able to offer him a beverage, you know, when he got there, I, I wanted to be hospitable you know, regardless of, what differences we, you know, we may have. I, I treat anybody and everybody, you know, respectfully. Yeah. So, I, and I had no idea what this man was going to do when he saw me, because he doesn't know I'm black. Is he going to attack me? Is he going to say, I'm not talking to you and walk away? Or is he going to come on in the room and do what he's supposed to do, sit down and be interviewed, which, which is, which is uh, what he agreed to. Mm -hmm. So, but in any event, I was going to be hospitable and offer him a drink. Well, um, the way the room just happened to be, if you were in the hallway at the door, you cannot see who's in the room because there's a wall there. You got to go around the corner, around the wall, and then there's the room. Mm. So I took the little lamp table, took the lamp off and put the table in the far obscure corner of the room and put a chair on one side for Mr. Kelly, a chair on the other side for me. And, in, and I had a little black duffel bag. And in my bag, I had the Bible and I had a cassette recorder, which I set in the middle of the table. Uh, all in hopes that he would come in and allow me to record our interview. And I had some blank cassettes in the bag. And so I'm all set. And uh, right on time, knock, 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 at 5.15, right on the button. Mary hops up. I'm seated, I'm seated at the table. Mary hops up and runs around the corner, opens the door, and walks what is known as the Grand Nighthawk. Nighthawk means bodyguard. Grand would be the bodyguard for the Grand Dragon. Like an Imperial Nighthawk is the bodyguard for the Imperial Wizard. Is he so in this, full, like, robe and everything? No, no, no. He, he's in, uh, the bodyguard's in uh, military camouflage. Hmm. And he has the, the, the red circle white cross patch on his chest here, the initials KKK here, and embroidered on his cap at Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. And over here, he had a semi-automatic handgun and a holster on his hip. Hmm. And he comes around, he comes around, and as soon as he saw, <laughs> came around the corner, he saw me <laughs> and just, you know, froze in place. 
And Mr. Kelly was walking right behind him in this dark blue suit and tie and didn't realize that his Nighthawk uh, had stopped short. He slammed into his back and knocked the Nighthawk forward. And now they both are stumbling around trying to regain their balance. And they're like looking all over the room like this, like, you know, and I'm just thinking. Yeah, I mean, it it was, it was funnier than Keystone Cops. I'm serious. (laughs) Laurel and Hardy, you know, Three Stooges. It was the whole thing. So I'm sitting at the table, you know, looking at them, watching this comedy and I could see in their faces, I knew exactly what they were thinking. It was, it was written, I mean, it was plain as day. They were thinking, did the desk clerk give us the wrong room number? Did we misunderstand something? Or was this an ambush? I could see it. And so I stood up and I displayed my, my palms to show I had nothing in my hands. And I walked forward, I said, hi, Mr. Kelly. And I extended my hand, I'm Daryl Davis. And he shook my hand, he shook my hand. And then the Nighthawk shook my hand. So I'm thinking, oh, this is good, this is good, you know, everything's okay. Come on in, come on in, please, please have a seat. Mr. Kelly sat down, everything's good. And the Nighthawk stood at attention on his right side. So I'm getting ready to sit down just opposite him. And he says to me, Mr. Davis, do you have any form of identification? I said, sure. Give him my driver's license. He looks at it, he goes, hmm, you live on Flat Street in Silver Spring. I'm thinking, wait a minute, why is he reading my street address? You know, that, that had unnerved me a little bit. Mm. You know, all he has to do is look at my picture, you know, look at my name, look at me, make sure that it all matches, and then give me back my license. And he's like, you know, looking at my street address. So does that mean he's gonna come to my house and burn a cross and what's up? Mm. So I didn't say any of this, but this is what I'm thinking. And, you know, already I know the animosity that he has against black people. A, he's in the Klan, and already I've been told by one of his former members, you know, don't go on his property if you wipe me out. Yeah. So so now the dude's memorizing my address, right? But I I already knew his address because the guy had given it to me, right? Yeah. And so um, anyway, he says, you live on such a street in Silver Spring. And um, I looked at him and I said, yes, that is where I live. And you live at? And I named his house, his street number, I mean, his uh, house number and his street. That way I was leveling the playing field. I was implying to him, if you come visit me, I'm gonna come visit you. So we're gonna confine all our visiting to this motel room. So he smiled, he nodded his head like he understood, you know, what I was implying or whatever. And um, I did not find out that day. It was many, many months down, down the road that I found out um, what, what all that address was all about. One of his guys lived right down here, right down my street in the next neighborhood. Mr. Kelly would have to travel down my street and turn off or whatever to go into that neighborhood uh. Uh, to, to visit his member or whatever. Today, that same guy sits in a federal prison for committing a hate crime. He's there for a while. Wow. So, um, so Mr. Kelly has simply recognized the street, that was all. It was pure coincidence, mm-hmm. but I had no way of knowing that at the time. Of course. And so anyway, we got on with the interview and, um, you know, like I told you, uh, within, within moments, you know, I, I'd asked the question, you know, how, how can he hate people? And he, that's, that's when he goes into the, um, you know, the brain size and the criminality and the laziness welfare business. And, you know, anytime he would um, reference the Bible, well, the Bible says, Mr. Davis, and I'd reach down and pull out my Bible and hand it to him. Yeah. Say, hey, show me, please, chapter and verse. Um, are they, they're a Christian group? Is that? They say they are, yes. Yeah. Yeah, they, 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 they consider themselves to be. Hmm. Now, they're not the Christians that I know, yeah. but, you know, just, just like, you know, I mean, every, every religion has its, has its, um, splinter cells there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Precisely. So, Anyway, um, you know, I, you know the, the Bible preaches racial separation. Well, here, show, show me where it says that. And, uh, or my, my uh, recorder would uh, run out of cassette tape. I'd reach down and get a fresh cassette tape. And every time I'd reach down, the Nighthawk would reach up um, mm-hmm. you know, to, to the butt of his gun. And, you know, I, I realized what was happening. I mean, he's doing his job. That's his job, to protect his boss. And he does not know what's in my bag. Mm-hmm. So... You know, I didn't blame him. I didn't fault him. You know, if that was my job, I'd do the same thing probably. So anyway, um, you know, every time I reach down, he reach up. Yeah. Well, 
after a while, he realized, you know, there was no threat in the bag, just the Bible and blanket sets. So I went in and out of the bag. He didn't even move. He, he relaxed. And a little over an hour uh, later, we were just having, you know, just like you and I are talking right now, all of a sudden out of the blue was this very quick, short noise. That was it. And it happened so fast um, and so short that my ear could not discern what it was. I kept playing it in my head, but I couldn't figure it out. But all in a split second, but with me trying to figure it out, I had jumped up out of my chair and hit the table. And because things were going through my head and I was getting ready to act. All, I mean, all in one split second, a multitude of information came to me. And I was hearing that former Klansman saying in my head, Daryl, don't fool with Roger Kelly, he'll kill you. I was hearing that voice. Um, I knew that, that Roger Kelly had made the noise. I was convinced, I knew he made it because I did not make it. So if I rule myself out, process of elimination, then it has to be him. And so I'm wondering what, the, what did I just say or what did I just do to cause this man to make this threatening, ominous noise that I cannot explain? And, but I knew that my life was in danger. Yeah. I feared for my life because I didn't know what that noise was and he had done something. And um, was it, it, did you think it was like a gun cocking or something? Or? It, no, I, I had no clue what it was. It, I, I know what a gun cocking sounds like. Um, I know what somebody moving their chair around sounds like. You know, I know what somebody hitting the table sounds like. Uh, there was nothing, you know, that, that it was just, that was it yeah. out of nowhere. And you know, what was that? You know, um, and it was the first time, you know, we, we'd been there for an hour, you know, so it wasn't a cricket you know, in the room or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's tension yeah yeah and uh so anyway um i literally i feared for my life so when you do that you go into what's called survival mode and there are only like four things you can do when you're in that mode um one one thing people do is they faint because the fear is so great their brain cannot process it and it shuts down mm. and they fall unconscious because it's just, just overwhelming. Um, I don't faint. The second thing people will do is their muscles will, will contract and they'll tighten up and, start, and they'll start shaking. And you can be punching them, kicking them. You know, they won't even be deflecting the blows. You, you've seen people get into a fight and curl yeah. up into a fetal ball. Mm -hmm. That's, it's called paralysis by fear. They yeah. can't move. And I don't do that either. The third thing uh, people will do which is the best thing to do, which I would have done if it was available option to me, is to run away, run away as quickly as you can, separate yourself from the source of the fear. And um, that was not an option for me because you can't outrun a bullet in a motel room. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a weapon, uh, my secretary did not have one. The only person who I knew for sure who had one was the Nighthawk, you, you could see it on his hip. I did not know if Mr. Kelly had one up under his suit jacket or not. Uh, but all I knew was this man you know, was threatening me and um, I have to act. So the only other option is the fourth option is to do a preemptive strike, get them before they get you. So that's what I was on my way to do. I was going to dive across that table. I was going to grab the Nighthawk, grab Mr. Kelly and slam them both down to the ground and um, disarm the Nighthawk because it's my job to protect myself and my secretary, just like it's his job to protect his boss and himself. Mm -hmm. So when I came up and hit the table, the whole time I'm thinking all this and I'm acting, my eyes are looking right into Roger Kelly's eyes. And I didn't say anything, but I could read his eyes. I knew he could read my eyes. He knew my eyes were saying, what did you just do? And I knew his eyes were saying, what did you just do? And, and the Nighthawk was like this, looking at both of us, you know, like what do either one of y'all just do? And he, again, he has his hand yeah. here. So, so unsettling. Yeah. And so Mary, she was sitting right to my left on top of the, um, the dresser because there were no more chairs. She popped herself up there. She realized what had happened and she began explaining it to us when it happened again. The ice in the bucket next to her has had begun melting. And, and so as it melted, the, the cans of soda shifted down the ice. God. That kind of thing. That was it. 
And, and that, you know, so we all started laughing, all of us. We, we just laughed and laughed about how ignorant we had been, you know? But this was not a learning moment that would come later, but it was a teaching moment. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the lesson taught is, is the lesson that I gave you earlier. You know, the ignorance breeds fear, fear breeds hatred, hatred breeds destruction. Yeah. Because we were ignorant of that noise the bucket of ice and cans of soda. And it had entered into our space by, by, by the noise that it made. And so we became fearful of what we were ignorant of. And, you know, I'm getting ready to destroy somebody because I think this guy hates me and I hate, you know, somebody who hates me and, and is going to destroy me. And the, the Nighthawk's ready to destroy anybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> no one wins namely me or my secretary, yeah. right. So, uh, so fortunately, it stopped just short of that, and we and we all had a good laugh over it. And then we we carried on with the interview, and um, you know the thing kept making the noise. We kept laughing, and you know everything was fine. He never reached you know for his for his weapon again. I went in and out of the bag, no problem. But um, you know I would keep in contact with Mr. Kelly. I would invite him to my gigs. I'd invite him down to my house right here, and um, you know we'd go out and have lunch. We'd have dinner. We'd have lunch right here at my table where I'm sitting right now. Hmm. Uh, all kinds of stuff. And um, usually he would bring the Nighthawk with him. And then it got to the point where he wasn't bringing the Nighthawk. You know, he trusted me that much. And he even rose to the next level of Imperial Wizard, national, national leader. He would invite me to clan rallies. So I would go to these things and see them do their thing, light their cross and parade around, give speeches and all that stuff. Um, but, you know, back, back to, that, to that, uh, that thing I was telling you about, the, the uh, ignorance, fear, hatred, and, and destruction. Yeah. You know, it's not just adults that, uh, that feel that way because I've done experiments. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of lectures at colleges and universities, but I also lecture to little kids, um, you know, middle school, elementary school, what have you. And of course, I tone down the lecture for them, but I, I still do it nonetheless. And I'll be in some classroom with some young, you know, young middle schoolers or, or uh, upper elementary school kids. And I'll be talking to them just like I'm talking to you right now. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, I'll say, hey, hey, there's a snake under your chair. You know, and just at my suggestion that there's a snake under somebody's chair, <laughs> half the class screams and throws their legs up in the air. Even though I'm pointing at one chair, people in the back still throwing their legs up <laughs> in the air. Okay, so... <laughs> 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 and um, you know, and they're screaming and carrying on, and uh, and then they see there's no snake, and you know I'm just you know joking with them or whatever, and so they start laughing, and I say you know why why did y'all you know scream and throw your legs up in the air, and they'll say you know I'm afraid of snakes I hate snakes, well there's your your fear and your hatred, and I'll say well what why what why do you hate snakes what why are you afraid of them, well. They're, they're slimy and, and they're poisonous. Well, now there's your ignorance. Snakes are not slimy at all. They're dry, okay? And, and, and you hate them because they're poisonous. Well, not all snakes are poisonous. So there, you know, there's your ignorance. So the ignorance breeds the fear, which breeds the hatred. They said they hate snakes. Yeah. Right? They're afraid of snakes. All right, so now I, I say to them, I say, look, obviously there's no snake under your chair. I was just joking. But let's just say there really was a snake under your chair and I pointed it out. What would you want me to do about it? You know what they say? Kill it. There's your destruction. And, and this is coming from little kids, yeah. preteen. So that, that chain is real. Yeah, it is. And it, but it's breakable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. So you want to talk about some music? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, may, I, may need a, I may need a drink first. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, wow, that's just, it's really powerful, man. And it's, it does show that you, you, you can break patterns and you can have inroads with people that you thought you may never have inroads with. And also, you don't have to write people off. You know, I think it's, right. it would be so easy for you to say, screw the clan. Like, they want to kill me. Like, they, they don't know me. Like, it would be so easy and justifiable for you to do that. And you, you made the decision, the conscious decision not to. Um, 
And I think you're led by curiosity in a lot of ways as well. Oh, yeah, so absolutely. I feel like you needed to scratch that itch either way. I lost my train of thought because I had something else, but honestly, this is a lot to digest. Um, but so let's, let's actually, yeah, let's take that time. Let's cut over to some music here. Um, I want to hear a little bit about the background of how you got into music and also the relationship of music and race, you know, to your point earlier um, of just, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis's influence and, and, you know, musical influence, like country and rock and roll and jazz, like all of this has the black experience as a part of that, like the music, yeah. the origins, if not directly influenced by like all comes from that. So absolutely, um, I think there is a, a tie there. And I think, do you, first of all, do you, before we get into, you know, you working with some of the legends, um, do you use music as part of bridge building? When I can, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause, because, you know, everybody likes music. I mean, let's just say, for example, um, t- tomorrow's Friday. So uh, I, I, we're on lockdown, but let's just say I want to yeah. go out. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we forget about that, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, forget about that. I'm going to the club. So, um, I want to go out. I want to go out dancing. I don't have a gig tomorrow night. So there's a club down the street. Uh, sometimes I have a band. Sometimes I have a DJ. But either way, they have music and a dance floor. And that's what I want to get out and do. Because mm-hmm. I have a night off. You, usually, I'm the one making the music. So everybody else can dance. Now I want to dance. So I go down there, and a good song comes on. Either the band's playing or the DJ's playing it, and I want to dance to it. So I'm looking. So what do I do? I look around to see if I see some single lady who's by herself. So I don't have to pick somebody's wife or something. And um, I see some lady sitting at the bar and she's tapping on the bar with her hand and beat to the music. So obviously she likes the song. So I go on over there, I don't know her. I go on over this, hey, you know, you wanna dance? And she's like, yeah. She pops off the bar stool, we go out to the dance floor. And if the song is a slow song, you know, we're wrapped around each other and we're turning slowly around the floor, whatever. If it's a fast song, you know, we're apart and we're shaking and whatever. Okay, so then at the end of the song, I escort her back to her bar stool, and I say, you know, I'm I'm Daryl Davis, and she says, I'm Mary Smith, and you know, um, I said, so what do you do, Mary? And she says, well, you know, I'm um, I'm uh, VP of marketing for Microsoft uh, on the East Coast region. Whoa, you know, she's making like you know probably half a million dollars a year, and so she says, you know, what do you do, Daryl? And I say, um, I'm a cashier at McDonald's or something like that. Yep. So I'm probably making maybe $10,000 a year. Where would two people that far apart yeah. come this close? Mm-hmm. Music. Yeah. Without even knowing what her name was. Okay. Love that. Music. Yeah. yeah. So music does, you know, what, what got that? You know, I, I, listen, if, had I walked into that bar, as a non-musician, just to come up, come there and dance, yeah. I would have had to fight my way out. Yeah. Damn to you, okay? Music got that Klansman up out of his chair to come put his arm around me and tell me how much he liked what I was playing. Yep. Music. So it, it, it is a uniter. It does bring people together. Everybody likes music. Even, even Klan people like music. Neo-Nazis mm-hmm. like music. You know, the construction worker likes music. The uh, high school teacher, the college professor, you know, the academic, the president of the United States, you know, they all like music. Yeah. So, you know, when, when, when you go to a, a party that's put on by um, a bank, a bank manager, um, most of the people at that party are going to be banking type people, uh, the auditors, the tellers, the branch managers, those kinds of people. Yeah. You go to a party that's put on by some uh, a computer company, it's going to be hardware people, software people, computer sales, IT, all that kind of stuff will be at that party. But when you go to a club or a festival to hear music, everybody is there. Yeah. The computer people, the bank people, the person who paints the double yellow line down the street, the guy who picks up your trash on Saturday at, you know, evening, mornings with the trash truck, mm-hmm. whatever. They're all there because they all like music. And it's a unifier. It, it is a unifier. No question about it. So when, when the opportunity is available, Yes, I, I do use music as a uh, as a tool of communication, great, and, and a point of uh, common ground. Yeah. It's my common ally. Ah, I love that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are certainly our common ally, my man. Um, you know? <laughs> thank you. And Thanks for saying you, that. You're more than welcome. You know, um, I you know I, I'm influenced by a lot of different 
a musical artist. I have my favorites. And, um, you know, I, I do a lot of old rock. My, my degree is in jazz, jazz performance. Mm. Uh, but what I play a lot of, and my, my heart is, I like blues, boogie woogie, uh, uh, rock and roll. And I've had the pleasure of, of working with some of the people who invented rock and roll. I uh, worked for 32 years on and off with uh, the late Chuck Berry. And, you know, there was no rock and roll before Chuck Berry. Yep. That, you know, things like that. Um, I like that music, Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard, Fast Domino, Bo Diddley, all these people, Carl Perkins. Um, and, you know, that music, let, let, let me say something that, that a lot of your audience may not realize. They, they all know the music, but they may not realize the significance of it. Yeah. Very important. You know, we, we pay a lot of tribute and a lot of honor, as we should, to a lot of the great uh, black and white uh, people who put who you know got on the front lines of civil rights and can, like Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and many others who were on the front lines of sit-ins of um, marches of boycotts uh, of demonstrations in order to bring white adults together with black adults. All right, we honor those people, but. Elvis Presley, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, Bill Haley, and all these other ones, Buddy Holly. These people did just that with their music. They yes. brought white kids together with black kids because up until rock and roll, and even during rock and roll, when it was first born, um, theaters, concert venues, if they allowed black people in the building at all, were segregated. There were, there were separate seating sections. There were ropes going around the seats that had signs hung, hanging off them that said seating for white patrons only or colored seating only. Hmm. You've seen those pictures. You've seen the yeah. ones of the, of the restrooms, colored restroom, yep. colored water fountain, whites only water fountain, that kind of thing. Same thing with, with the theaters and, and concert halls. They were separated, segregated, if they allowed black people in at all. Some didn't even allow black people on the property, period, no matter who was playing. Yeah. Um, so anyway, if, if you and I were to go see Chuck Berry back in the day, or something like that, in the 50s, you and I could not sit together. That was against the law. There were laws. Just yeah. like the law that, that got Rosa Parks arrested on the bus. That, that was the law. It's a stupid law, yeah. but nonetheless, it was on the books. So you and I might get together outside the theater, but we could not sit together, all right? So if, if, if we're in the 1940s or whatever, and we go to see Frank Sinatra um, or, or the Dorsey brothers or Glenn Miller or whoever, uh, Benny Goodman, we sat in our own separate seating section as designated by what? The color of our skin. How stupid is that, yeah. okay? But that's, what, that's how it was. That's, that's what your grandparents had to do, mm -hmm. all right? So now, um, People obeyed those laws. They didn't cross sit because they would get arrested. They obeyed the law. But two phenomenons happened in the 1950s that those laws were still in place. One phenomenon was the invention of rock and roll by the black artists, Chuck, Richard, uh, Bo Diddley, Little Richard, Fast Domino. And it was, it was popularized by the white ones, their contemporaries, Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, Bill Haley in the Comets, Buddy Holly, Carl Perkins, yeah. on and on, all right? But here's the thing, those laws were in place, but when those guys came out on stage playing that new beat, that boogie woogie with a backbeat, mm -hmm. everything before that was swing. Yep. Right? There's never been any kind of backbeat. <laughs> Those kids, black and white, could not sit still. They bounced up out of their chairs for the first time in our history, knocked over those signs and ropes, and they were boogieing and dancing in the aisles together for the first time in the history of this country. And rock and roll caused that. That's why a lot of mayors and city fathers uh, banned rock and roll from coming to their towns, not just in the South, but also in the North, mm. because it was causing race mixing. And they didn't want that. The police would literally come into those shows and pull the plugs out of the wall. That, this concert is over, done, finished. You know, because yeah. they didn't. They were not going to promote, you know, black kids and white kids dancing together. Now, think about this for a second. 
all right? Those kids who did that, these teenagers, they, they, they did not go to high school with those black kids. Because remember, schools were segregated back then, yeah. right? So they didn't have any interaction with those kids. Most towns had a railroad track going through them. And as you know, blacks lived on one side, whites lived on the other side of the, of the railroad track. That's where that term comes from. Yeah, other he's, side he's of the wrong, tracks. Yeah, yeah the other side of the tracks side. or the wrong side of the tracks, something like that, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So, so these people were, were, you know, these black people were from the wrong side of the tracks. And they never interacted with them before. You know, they see them over on the other side of the tracks. Yeah. You know, but they didn't, they didn't hang out and interact. And now they're like dancing, you know, frantically and hanging out in the aisles and boogieing and, you know, <laughs> with no care. Uh, <laughs> you know, this was, white adults could not understand that. And they were like furious. Yeah. You know, you know, we can't have this. That's why they were so down on rock and roll. They were so down on Elvis Presley because he was singing black music and wiggling around like a black guy and, all, and doing all, that, all those crazy gyrations, which are, of course, Mickey Mouse today. Yeah. But back then, you know. <laughs> it's changed quite a bit there. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so anyway. Um, That's funny, too, because like, from everything I've heard about that, it was always the sexualized nature of his movements that you hear about. You don't hear yeah. the racial story behind that. Yeah, because well, he got it from black people, which he did. Yep. That's, that's what they did. So now um, these kids who are doing this, they're dancing with black kids for the first time. You know, they have to process that when they get home. Yeah. Now, it's not like, you know, they, they ran out the next day and, and, and looked for those black kids that they danced with and made best friends. No, I'm not saying that, but they had to process it. And they're thinking, well, you know, these kids, you know, they're not so bad. You know, they, they do the same thing we want to do. We want to dance. They're dancing. You know, nobody got hurt. Nobody got raped. Nobody got robbed. You know, they're not so bad. Um, you know, they're, they're not what they're, they're realizing. They're not exactly what their parents told them. Right. Yeah. So when they grow up and, and they still don't go to school with them, and and they will never go to school with them because by the time they're they're they'll age out of it. They'll yeah. age out, you know, when integration finally, you know, mm-hmm. comes in to their school. Yeah. Um, but when they when they get older and, and get married and stuff, they do not pass on the same amount yes. of racism to their kids that was passed on to them. Yep. So it's a little bit less. And then when their kids grow up, it's even and, and they have kids, their grandkids are, are getting less. And then it's the next generation, when they're born and they grow up, those are the ones who voted for Barack Obama. Mm. Look at that cycle. Look at that cycle. Full circle back to the origins of exposure. Exactly. Okay. Because each time they're thinking, well, they're not so bad. They're not so bad. You know? And and see, listen, 20 years ago, uh, Barack Obama or any black person, and there have been plenty of black people who've been qualified mm-hmm. to be president of the United States. Yep. He wasn't he wasn't the first one who was qualified. He's having to be the first one who won. Yeah. All right. Now, 20 years ago, even if Barack Obama w- was running back then, he never would have made it because the, the attitudes were not ready to vote for a black man by, by, by the majority of white people. All right. Um, black people only make up 12 percent of this country. So even if every black person in this country, including babies and their pets, could vote, that would not have been enough to put Barack Obama in the White House. It wasn't black people who put him in the White House. It was white people, because we needed that white vote to add to our 12%. And, and guess what? A lot of that 12% isn't even registered to vote. All right? So a lot of white people voted in 2008 for Barack Obama, that's what put him in the White House. Because we did not have enough of our own. To, you know, as I said, even if every black person was registered and voted, that still would yeah. not have been enough. 12% is not enough. So we needed that yeah. white help. 20 years ago, that white help would not be there for us. It, it was by 2008, all right? So a lot of that can be traced back to a lot of things, but rock and roll is included. That's amazing. A lot of people, a lot of people don't, don't, don't see that. I do. Yeah. Yeah, the passed down generationally, what that meant, um, and how music was the catalyst behind all that. That's just sure. fascinating. Um, and and to be clear, you know, you had said you've worked with some 
great artist and that you admire the artists you mentioned, but you also played with those artists. So Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis, yeah. Lewis uh, Muddy Waters, BB King. I mean, blues legends, like you're on stage with them. So I, I don't want that to be lost on our audience to the significance of the music that you create. Um, you're right there up there with them. Well, I, ne- I never played it, played with Muddy Waters himself. I knew him very well. Mm. I, I played with his band uh, after he passed on. The band continued, uh, they, they called, it was called the Muddy Waters Blues Band when he was alive. Yeah. And then later it was called the Legendary Blues Band. Gotcha, okay, okay. I played okay. with it then, that was his whole band. But I knew Muddy very well. Well, either way, you were in the presence of legends. Um. Oh, indeed. And, and, I, and, and I, I, you know, not, not one moment of that is lost on me. I realize, you know, I got a lot from the people who created it. I got hands-on training, something that I could never get in my four years of college. Or even if I'd gone to, to, to college 10 years and gotten a doctorate in music, yeah. nothing beats, beats getting hands-on training from people like Chuck Berry or Pine Top Perkins or or Johnny Johnson, or some of these legends, you know, yeah. who, who created those genres. Yeah, and everything in life. I think that real life experience is a bigger educator than any institution. But yeah, um, yeah I, I, I'll tell you. I'll tell you one quick funny story before I please. go here. Yeah, let me uh, show you this. Is um, was uh, he was a Muddy Waters piano player, legendary man. Um, one of the forefathers of blues piano and boogie woogie piano, one of the greatest when he was living. And uh, he, he would teach me how to play. He would stay at my house you know, when he was in town wow. with Muddy Waters and stuff like that. And uh, anyway, I was a pallbearer at his funeral. Uh, he was 97 years old when he died, still playing blues and boogie woogie piano. Wow. I was a pallbearer for Johnny Johnson. Johnny Johnson was Chuck Berry's original piano player. The song Johnny Be Good was named after Johnny Johnson by Chuck. Oh, wow. So anyway, you know, he was, he would stay at my house. He would teach me stuff. And they both, they both referred to me as their godchild. But uh, anyway, um, uh, Muddy Waters, uh, well, you know, when, when Muddy would tour England back in the day, uh, Eric, Eric Clapton was in a band called the Yardbirds mm-hmm. and, and the Cream and other things. They would open up for Muddy Waters because you know they were teenagers. You know, you know, they they loved American blues, just like the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. You know, the Beatles used to open up for Little Richard. Yeah. So did the Rolling Stones. Uh, so you know, Eric Clapton, those people, you know, they loved the blues, and and they would open up for Muddy Waters and stuff like that. And then in later years, of course, they surpassed Muddy Waters. Uh, you know, Muddy never got the credit that he deserved. Uh, a lot of, you know, King of the Blues, Eric Clapton, King of the Blues, Stevie Ray Vaughan, you, you know, all this kind of, of stuff. And, you know, anyway, you, you, you get the point. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, point taken. So, so the, the roles got flipped. And, and so now Muddy Waters, who's a legend, is opening up for Eric Clapton. So, they, so Eric Clapton had come to the bigger, not, now I'm, I'm not faulting Eric Clapton. Eric Clapton always gave credit where credit was due mm-hmm. and still does. And, um, he came, he came to the big arena that was has been torn down since called Capital Center. Capital Center hold, uh, held at about 18 to 20,000 people. And he, he'd sell out the place. And uh, anyway, wow. Muddy, Muddy Waters would tour as, as the opening act this particular year. And uh, anyway, um, so Pine Top, the piano player, would, you know, would stay at my house. And so I drive him to the Capital Center and we're backstage. Now Muddy Waters' favorite drink like Pine Tops, was a, a Hennessy Cognac. Mm. And uh, anyway, I'm standing there with Muddy and, uh, and Pine Top, and uh, Eric Clapton comes up, and, and he has a, a gift, a gift package, all wrapped up. And uh, he says, Muddy, I got something for you. He goes, oh, what is it, Eric? And he gives it to him, and Muddy opens it, and it's a bottle of, uh, of Hennessy Cognac. And, um, and, and uh, Muddy says, oh, Eric, you know, I, I, I stopped drinking. I don't, I don't drink no more, man. You know, yeah, I, I had to give it up. You know, you know, he was for health problems or whatever yeah. reason he gave it up. And so um, Eric goes, oh, I didn't know, man. You know, it's okay. So, so he says, um, well, Eric, you know, can, can I give it to my boy here? Meaning me. Can I give it to my boy? And Eric says, yeah, do whatever you want to do with it, right? So Muddy handed it to me, right? So I'm, so I'm saying, you know, I thank, I thank Eric, I thank Muddy. And so in my mind, you know, I, I don't drink at all. I never drank. Yeah. So what the hell am I doing with a bottle of booze? But in my mind, it was something that was given from Eric Clapton 
to Muddy Waters to Daryl Davis. Wow. Right? So um, I, I was very proud of it. I took it home and I set it. Um, I lived at my parents' house. I was a teenager. I set it on my, um, on my parents' uh, mantelpiece, fireplace, on the mantel, top of the mantel in the uh, family room. And you just sat there like a, you know, like a piece of, uh, you know, decoration furniture or something. And I would see it every time I'd walk by the room, you know, and then, um, and, and then I wouldn't even notice it. You know, you, you walk by and you see it, you don't see it because it's been there for so long. Yeah. So uh, one day, uh, a long while later, um, I happened to walk past that room and something was strange. I got backed up. It wasn't on the mantelpiece. It was missing. Something seemed, you know, wrong with the room. And I'm like, where's that bottle? And uh, I like looked over. It wasn't there. Now we did a, we did a lot of entertaining. My parents my parents drank, and you know, and they socialized and and had people over, you know, cocktails and things like that or whatever. So and we had a bar in our house in the basement. So I thought, okay, well maybe he he poured some for for one of his friends or something. And so I went down to the bar and went through the bottles. It wasn't there. It's like it totally vanished. Hmm. And um, my, neither my mom or, nor my dad were home, were home at this particular time. So I'm like freaking out. My gift from Eric Clapton to Muddy Waters to me was missing. You know, had somebody stolen it? You know, what's up? So <laughs> I, I'm just totally flustered. And later that day, I'm in my kitchen getting something to eat. And I finished eating. And I go to throw, scrape the plate into the trash can before putting it in the, in the dishwasher, open the trash can, and there's my bottle. I reach in, I pull it out, I wash it off. It's empty. What's up? My dad's been drinking it. Oh. But, but, I, sa- but I saved it. <laughs> here it is right here, bro. No this is way. It. Yes way. Yes way. This is it. It's empty, but I still have it. From Eric Clapton to Muddy Waters to Daryl Davis. Oh, my God. That is an artifact, man. Yes, indeedy. Wow. What a story. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess uh, the liquid doesn't matter, right? It's the, that's right. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> no one's going to use it anyways. That, that's that right. Part of that circle. So, <laughs> wow. Well, all right, man. I really appreciate you know you taking me, the time with me. Me too. Thank you so much. Honestly, it, it's such a treat and an honor uh, to be talking with you. And honestly, you know, from a personal level too. Um, you know, I live in a multiracial family. My wife is British Sri Lankan. My daughter is multiracial. Um, it matters that she grows up in a world where people like you are out there doing hard work, man. I appreciate that, man. Stay in touch with me. I definitely will, buddy. (laughs) More than you you might want. (laughs) Uh, You're welcome to. Thank you. All right. Take Take care, care. Daryl. Bye-bye.